This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Shapeshift. With no account or sign-up required, it's the easiest way to buy and sell gems, counterparty, Dogecoin, Dash, and other leading cryptocurrencies. Go to shapeshift.io to instantly convert your altcoins and to discover the future of cryptocurrency exchanges. Welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we are joined by Christian Decker, who is a researcher at ETH Zurich. He has, he has a very interesting idea about scaling Bitcoin using off-chain networks. First, we would like to have an introduction from you, Christian. Yeah, hi. Thanks for having me. I'm, uh, as you said, I'm a researcher at ETH Zurich. I am also one of the early adopters of Bitcoin, uh, you can say. I started in 20, uh, 2009, uh, a few weeks after the original paper, and I thought, heck, that's, that's a nice thing. I would like to try that. And uh, later, when it came time to uh, choose a topic for my PG, I didn't have to look too hard to basically say, hey, Bitcoin might be a good uh, topic. Took some time to, uh, to convince my professor, but in the end, it turned out to be the greatest topic he had and for a long time. Wow, I, I didn't realize it was 2009, because I don't know actually who's the person we've had on the show who was earliest involved in Bitcoin. So I guess my current, was he 2009 or 2010? Gavin Andreessen was 2010, I guess, no. I'm not sure. We had we actually had a uh, the the first Zurich Bitcoin meetup was in uh, 2011 uh, with Mike Hearn and uh, Stefan Thomas from uh, from today's Ripple. Right. So, right. Uh, yeah. That was that was that's quite amazing how how far we got uh, with uh, with Bitcoin and uh, similar t- uh, technologies. Uh, that was that was an interesting meeting back then. Yeah. So you've been interested in the topic sort of continuously since then. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say I, I, I have been, I, I have been following Bitcoin for a long time. Uh, I think my first involvement was trying to reverse engineer the protocol, part of the protocol specification or documentation, as it's called today, uh, is uh, was made by me and one other guy, I guess, um, and uh, yeah, we, I was, I was involved quite a long time. Um, and I just stopped mining a few days ago. Oh, uh, really? After six and a half years, yeah. <laughs> that kind of hurt. So you were, you had, what, like Butterfly Labs or, or KNC equipment and you were running that at I home? I had one, one of the first edition Jalapenos uh, and uh, yeah, that, that stuck with me for a long time and now it was time to shut it off because it, it's not worth it anymore. Cool. That's that's fascinating. Actually, I didn't I didn't realize you had been such an early uh, adopter and so deeply involved for such a long time. I guess it, it was just just lucky and yeah. It it also brought me some some headlines when uh, in 2012 9,000 bitcoins were stolen from my wallet. So <laughs> from your wallet? Yeah, I actually I actually managed to lose 9,000 bitcoins. To a hacker, and but it got me on the on the on the front page of the New York Times. So, wow, you would have been, have been a millionaire with with that stash. Uh, yeah. So so people keep telling me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I personally, I don't know if if uh, I would have paid nine thousand pound uh, bitcoins to be on the front page of the New York Times. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I mean that that's one of the perks of being an early adopter, right? You you somehow mined all these coins and uh, uh, you didn't invest anything, and, and then you lost them, and so yeah. It's like you lost a lottery ticket, but one that actually won. <laughs> so actually, that makes it particularly interesting, no? Because. We have talked about this topic again and again, and we keep coming back to it, which is the sort of topic of uh, scaling Bitcoin. And and one of your ideas that we'll we'll talk about in a little bit does relate to that. But I'm sure you, as as someone who's sort of, you know, been through that whole history, you have a lot of opinions on that in general. So how have you 
how have you been participating and, and, and thinking about, you know, this debate and controversy and, and arguments that are going on about, you know, the block size increase and how Bitcoin can be scaled? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, the whole topic of, of the blockchain uh, block size increase is uh, less of a technical problem, I, I have to say. It's, it's more about uh, economics and incentives. Um, and it also strongly depends on, on what we want to uh, we want to achieve with this uh, with this network. Um, I mean, in my first publication, I basically showed that there are some natural limits to how many transactions can uh, the, the network can uh, support, and that was three years ago. Um, and uh, I basically used that as a starting off point uh, for for the rema uh, remainder of my research. Um, but the limits were a lot higher than what we are talking uh, talking about today, which is one or two or eight megabytes. Uh, I don't have the current numbers, but I, I would I would believe that that we can support sixteen megabyte blocks without pr uh, too many problems. Um, that's that's a natural limit, I'd say. At, at that point, the network just isn't fast enough to propagate the block uh, to, uh, through the network so that the majority knows about this block before a new block being found in the remainder of the network. Um, that being said, we have some lower limits, uh, which are uh, uh, of an economical nature, um, meaning that at some point it just becomes unfeasible for people to participate in this network. Um, I'm definitely not an expert on, uh, on those kind of issues, but uh, I, would, I would say we can definitely support, uh, support slightly larger blocks today. So, so this one is, this, so this higher limit of, you're saying 16 MB is, does it come through, through your paper, uh, information propagation in the Bitcoin network? Yes, that's that's exactly the uh, the uh, the publication I was talking about. That's basically us trying to point out the natural limits of what the network can support, and we thought we could uh, analyze how blockchain forks came to be, and then take the the blockchain forks as an, an sort of uh, um, a symptom of uh, of not being able to reconcile the the global state of uh, of the network anymore, um, and we have found that larger blocks also uh, lead to a slower propagation in the network. No, not much of a surprise there, uh, but we have a few numbers in there as well, namely that at the uh, at the time about one kilobyte of extra data was re uh, would result in the median time of uh, Note noticing a block was delayed by 80 milliseconds. So that is probably faster today. Um, and we do have a new publication coming out, hopefully uh, sometime soon, uh, which actually shows that there has been an improvement over time. Um, but uh, it, it, it still remains the, the, the problem that we cannot uh, we, we cannot scale too quickly uh, to, to larger block sizes. So let's get like an on the ground feel for this for this number. So what you're saying is if you add one kilobyte to the block, uh, the, prop the median propagation time increases by 80 milliseconds. So that means if you add one, one MB to the block, uh, it, uh, it would affect the median propagation time by 80 seconds, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, so basically, that, that was, what you're that saying was back then. I have to say, so back, that was back then. So, so, so let's say let's let's just just to see uh, just as a thought experiment. Let's say that that number held true today. Uh, so, what, when you go from say um, one MB to ten MB, so you are adding nine more MBs. Uh, then the the median propagation time would be say impacted uh, nine times into eighty. So that's like 7, 7, 20, uh, 7, 20 seconds, right? So that is over over ten minutes. Yeah. Uh, what and ten minutes is the block time for Bitcoin. What would happen if one block needs more than ten minutes to propagate to the network? What would happen to the network in that scenario? 
So our expectation is that uh, the, the first block would basically split the network in half because the by the time we have reached a majority of, uh, of the network, we already have a second block propagating through the network. Uh, or we have an expectation one block propagating in the network already. Um, so that, uh, that way we would definitely create a, a, hard, uh, a blockchain fork. Um, now, the resulting network is smaller, so the, the two partitions of the network are smaller, but they will work on, uh, on, on uh, competing blockchain forks, right? Um, now, it is possible that we, uh, that we then lose, uh, that, that we then find another block in one of these partitions and find again uh, another block in this partition. At this point, we have a three-headed uh, uh, blockchain fork, and this we uh, this this will not be resolved in uh, in a um, in in, the, in a single next round of, of blocks being found, right? So what we uh, what we actually lose is one confirmation on the uh, on the uh, on the number of confirmations we have to wait for uh, for us to be certain that the transaction goes through. And the extreme case is that we actually fork off indefinitely. Yeah. So so basically, you start having. Uh, but let let's say if you take the if you take this skillless back a little bit, we say okay, it's not seven hundred twenty seconds. So you know, twelve minutes. But let's say it's four minutes that it takes to propagate. Then we are still left with a scenario that there are a lot of forks. Uh, all the time and they go deeper than just you know one block they can happen you know two blocks deep or maybe even three in a worst case in a, in a bad case so you start having a uh, very uh, probably uh, behaviors that you don't want it so so i mean the, the 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 one thing we will have for sure is that we lose certainty into what this being confirmed in a, in a transaction actually means uh, today we can be reasonably sure that if if my transaction ends up in in a block, then that means that yes, it it, it is being confirmed, right? Uh, today's blockchain fork rate is about one point five percent, meaning that we have about two and a half forks every day. Um, if we if we go uh, if if we have this uh, this sort of higher fork rate, then we suddenly lose this, this certainty and, and we need more confirmations for us to regain the certainty. On the other dimension, we have now a lot of computational resources being spent in a network to work on forks, which are eventually going to be orphaned. And that might be even the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the scenario which is worse, because now uh, we are having this huge number of fights between mining pools and lots of resources being uh, being wasted, and we actually facilitate a large miner uh, who might not have fifty percent or more. Uh, suddenly, he needs much less. He has to fight only against uh, against other pools that are that suffer this delay in propagation, uh, while he doesn't have have to. So this this all plays into into sort of selfish mining again which uh, which gets easier if you have a high blo uh, blockchain fork rate so uh, so in essence what you're saying is uh, let's assume that 60% of the mining power is in china and then 40% is in the united states just 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 quite simply so what you're saying is bef uh, because a block made in china needs a lot of time to propagate to a block made in the united states the 60% of the miners in China, because they hear about the blocks earlier, as a cartel, they can they can come to a situation where they keep dominating the American miners uh, every time. And uh, effectively, in order to get like 51% of the network, you just have to be in China, a Chinese miner, and have more than half of their 60%, which is like 30%. And like your effective power in the network is like a 51% minor because you can always outcompete the American ones due to the block propagation problems. Yes, uh, you are with, with uh, by adding delay into into the uh, into the uh, 
propagation, then you, you are basically weakening the remainder of the network compared to the block finder. So we, we don't need to go as far as saying, hey, this is China and this is, uh, this is uh, the rest of the world. We just need to say, this is, we, we have a group here which is strongly connected with really, really fast connections. And the next block is being found in this cluster. And then we have a weakly connected other cluster and the, weak, uh, and the cluster which has not found the block will be at a disadvantage over the cluster that has found the block because they will hear it later. Right. I mean, I think that's that's why, uh, you know, the episode we, uh, Meher and Sebastian did on Bitcoin NG, I thought it's such a nice, uh, such a nice proposal, you know, because it just gets rid of so many of these problems. Yeah, you, you resolve quite a quite a lot of, of the of the races there. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a really interesting proposal and uh, uh, Emin Gunzira, one of the authors, will be present at my defense later in January. <laughs> so I, I hope I get to talk to him about that proposal as well and see what we can do with it. So defense, of course, being for your uh, PhD thesis, because you're, yeah. you're doing a PhD thesis about Bitcoin at the moment. Right? Yeah. So uh, talking about PhD thesis, I think perhaps this is a good, uh, a good segue to, to talk about your research and uh, the one project that I think you are known for that has some attention in, in is, is your duplex network and duplex being essentially uh, like the lightning network, which I think a lot of people know and, and you know, we've done a show about as well. So can you talk a bit about how you came to work on that? So we, we had some research before that concentrating on, on how to extract application data from blockchain, uh, of, from the Bitcoin blockchain. And uh, once we finished that, we noticed that there is uh, a possibility to, to actually scale up the number of transactions that, uh, that the current uh, blockchain can support but simply having moving all of these transfers off the blockchain. Um, and uh, we then started, we, we basically took uh, the, uh, the simple micropayment channel, which is implemented in, uh, w which was implemented by Mike Hearn uh, into uh, Bitcoin J and which we had used before and thought, okay, that, there's, there's, a, there's a limitation there. Uh, we can, we lock in funds into this channel and uh, we can transfer it at, uh, at most once from one end to the other, simply because, well, there is no way to move this, these coins back. Uh, so what we thought we would, uh, we would like to do is to simply have a construction where we can send money both ways, hence a duplex in, in, in the title. Um, and we used we use the construction which uh, which starts creating two simple micropayment channel network uh, two simple micropayment channels between two peers one going in one direction and the other one going in the other direction now the problem is that i mean if you charge these channels uh, on on both ends with one bitcoin and you send one bitcoin in one direction and the other bitcoin in the other direction then there is the, uh, the, this guy still has uh, some some credit on uh, on these construction of two channels, but it's on a wrong channel. He cannot send it back to this. So what we try to do is basically just take these sets or uh, these pairs of, of uh, simple micropayment channels, flip them over, and now having credit back on the channel that that you can actually spend from. Um, that took a bit more uh, more of a detour than we were planning to, but in the end we had a, uh, I would say, really nice and really clean construction that, that actually achieved this, um, having two mi simple micropayment channels which can be reset uh, if the capacity on one of them is consumed and you'd like to transfer capacity from one to the other. So, so maybe just to give a little bit of background, because I'm sure some people will, will not be familiar with payment channels. Uh, and basically the idea is, as far as I understand it, and, and of course, feel free to correct me, is that, right, you say on Bitcoin, uh, the, the number of transactions is sort of limited. But what you can do is you can sort of 
lock up Bitcoins or you, you can sort of put them in a multi-sig address that, you know, only several people can spend together. And then you sort of go offline and you send each other um, signed transactions. So you can basically move money around and you still can do it securely because uh, the person can sort of go back to the Bitcoin network to sort of claim their money. But uh, while you're moving these transactions around, well, you don't actually have to, you know, you, you don't have to wait for confirmations. You don't have to put them in a block, right? So you, you can sort of have your cake and eat it too in terms that you have the security of the blockchain, but you don't have all the downsides of it, such as, you know, uh, limits and the costs and the speed, but you can, you can do it immediately and um, much cheaper, much faster. So yeah, the, the, um, basically the micropayment channels, both the simple one as well as, as the duplex micropayment channel, as well as uh, the Lightning Network, are a form of smart, uh, smart contracts. Uh, smart contracts basically allow you to encode part of your business logic into sc the scripting language uh, by, uh, used by Bitcoin. And at any point in time, the parties participating in this contract have the assurance that uh, what has been uh, what has been agreed on will uh, will eventually take effect, and we use we use the blockchain only to set up these contracts, and in the end to either uh, settle them or to mediate some uh, some conflict we we had uh, we had between us, and the important part in all of this is that at, at any point in time all parties have. Uh, have the assurance that what what has been agreed upon will have, will actually take place, and this assurance comes in the form of a transaction. Which, if we want to settle or if we want to uh, have conflict mediation, then we just take these transactions, broadcast them into the Bitcoin network, and the Bitcoin network will take care of resolving our conflict. So, uh, in your in your in your like around five minutes ago, you went through. Kind of three iterations of micropayment channels. You started with the simple one, and then you moved into one where. Um, so you started with the simple one, which is Meher paying Christian, yeah, and only Meher can pay Christian, uh, and that's it. So this is the kind of micropayment channel that our listeners would be aware. We discussed on the episode with Streamium, where somebody is streaming a video, and the other paying is uh, other person wants to look at the video and pay him money. So in that case, the money only needs to flow from the person who is seeing a stream to the person who is creating a stream. So it's, it's only in one direction. Yeah. That was the simplest one that was invented by Mike Hearn and Spielman. Yeah. Then, then you went into these two other kinds of channels in which um, uh, money can initially money can flow in both directions, like from Meher to Christian and Christian to Meher. And then you went into the third most complex one in which not only can the money flow in both directions, but the liquidity is also saved. Like you don't need to lock up as much money as in the second design, right? Yes. So, uh, so the difference is um, in the second scenario you mentioned, we just have two channels in, in both directions, right? Uh, and we cannot transfer more than what has been allocated to, uh, to either of the channels. Uh, in the second case, we are actually using, we are still using simple micropayment channels for, uh, for both directions. But what we can do now is we take the money that it, or the coins that are bound to one channel and are therefore bound to move only in one direction. And we flip them from one channel to the other in an atomic way. So that way, suddenly, if, if I transfer uh, 0.5 Bitcoins to you and you transfer your whole Bitcoin on your channel to me back, then you still have uh, credit for 0.5 Bitcoins, but they are bound to the wrong channel. So what we do now is we destroy the two channels. We build up two new channels. And now I have a channel which, from which I can send 1.5 uh, Bitcoins to you or, uh, and you have a channel where you can send 0.5 Bitcoins from you to me, uh, which was the amount I previously sent to you, right? Let, let me just interject here, because I think there's, there's one thing we need to briefly explain so, so people can make sense of that, unless they rec remember the streaming episode well, right? Which is that 
uh, you can only go sort of in one direction in a channel, right? Because yeah. if I give Mayher, you know, 0.2 of that Bitcoin in the channel, then Mayher has the option to like cash in that 0.2 uh, in the Bitcoin blockchain. Now I can say I give you 0.3 and that works, right? Because uh, Mayer can cash in either one, but of course he's only going to take the bigger one, but he can't give me money back on that channel, right? Because let's say he signs a new transaction that gives me only 0.25. Uh, I can't rely on that because at any time Mayer could cash the 0.3, right? So you have that problem that if you've gone in one direction in a channel, well, you can't go the other way, right? And so now what you're saying is there's basically a way to sort of flip that so you can start going the other way. Yes. So, so the, the, the problem in a simple, uh, simple micropayment channel is exactly what I was talking about before, that uh, if you receive some money, you will always have the assurance in the form of a transaction giving you that money uh, that, uh, that, you can, that you can get that money. Uh, if, if you transfer it back, I, I, I cannot destroy your, uh, your assurance. Um, but uh, so, so, so what we do is basically we destroy the whole setup uh, until you get to this assurance, replacing the whole construction. Um, what Lightning does is basically give, uh, have, uh, finding a way to um, replace your assurance with uh, something that uh, basically hurts you if you try to cash in that one. So I think I think I think this is the this is the crucial point which uh, which is kind of hard to appreciate. So let's just walk through this one. Um, so in a in a so what's happening in a normal micro payment channel? In a normal micro payment channel, when uh, let's say it's between Meher and Christian in the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. So when I want to send you one Bitcoin, uh, like. For example, let's say uh, let's say you are you are you're this you're creating content and I, I want to pay you for the content, and then I foresee that the maximum amount I will spend uh, I will spend on this content is one Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So in the normal case, the way it would work is we would create a multi-signature address and lock that one Bitcoin in that joint account which is owned by both you, Christian, and me, Meher. So both of us are joint owners of that one Bitcoin. And we can imagine this as a cake. And then we are just, uh, so this, this cake is, is created on the Bitcoin blockchain. And uh, this cake has a time lock. So if nothing happens, the, the cake will be uh, divided. Like one, I will get the one Bitcoin back, let's say one day later. And Christian will get nothing. So that's the cake. And one day later, I get to eat the cake completely if nothing else happens. Now, off chain, off the blockchain, Christian and I can uh, can figure out a way of dividing this cake amongst each other. So I can send a statement to Christian that says, uh, "Okay, now Christian gets two percent of the cake, and I get only ninety-eight percent of the cake." And uh, we don't broadcast this to the blockchain, but uh, once our transaction is over, Christian could take that 2% broadcast it to the blockchain and get the actual bitcoins in return right so that's that's the simple micro payment channel case now what you're saying is the problem with this case is the the money can only flow from meher to christian mm -hmm. but you could always imagine that we could make two different cakes so yes. if if uh, if uh, if christian uh, so let's say now we are in a different scenario where uh, both both the people are providing services to each other. So, uh, like Meher is streaming content and Christian is also streaming content, and both of them like uh, want to pay each other. So you can you can create two cakes. So one cake for payment flow from Meher to Christian, and then another cake for payment flow from Christian to Meher, and then you start to decide how how much. How, what percentage of each cake does Meher own and what percentage of each cake does Christian own? And then once this division is complete, both of us broadcast the transactions to the network and we split our funds. Yeah. Right. So these are the these are the first two basic scenarios. And now what you're saying is the duplex micropayment channel adds something, a third capability to this scenario. Yeah. So so what, what we do is uh, once we once we have 
so so I gave you all of my cake, uh, but I but I do own about let's say half of of the cake, uh, of the other cake. Then what we do is we just we just uh, we just say okay let's let's forget about all of that. Now I create I create a new cake which is half of the previous cake, which I can send from me to you, and. On the other side, we create a cake which is worth one and a half cakes, which you can send to me. And we have reset basically the whole scenario and we can restart trading again. So what happens now is that I can actually send you more than one cake in total and you can send me more than one cake in total. Due, uh, due to this reset, we can, we can actually have millions and millions of, uh, we, we can transfer these coins or cakes or whatever you want to call them. <laughs> Uh, we can transfer them multiple times, so that's the whole idea of uh, of, of the of, of the construction. Yeah. So basically, in an optimal scenario, we are left with millions of cakes. <laughs> in an optimal scenario, I owe you one thousand cakes, and you owe me one thousand cakes, and so we don't have to transfer anything. No, I'm certainly glad that we've we've extensively talked about cakes because this is a topic we've completely neglected so far in the history of this podcast. <laughs> but it's obviously very important. Our show today is brought to you by our friends at Shapeshift.io. Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to trade altcoins, and they now support over 50 cryptocurrencies, which includes all the ones you have ever heard of, unless you have no life and spend way too much time on Bitcoin talk. So if you want to trade all coins, there's the old way of doing it, which means creating an account somewhere, giving them all your data, uh, depositing your money, and then growing old while hoping for the best. Or there's a shapeshift way, which is fast, easy, and means getting it all done in less than a minute while not even needing an account. So here's something to consider. Shapeshift is a company that really stands by its values and goes out of its way to protect users' private data. One way they do this, obviously, is by not requiring you to give them any personal information to use a service since you can't even create an account to use it. And secondly, when BitLicense was enacted in US, Shapeshift was the first company to say, screw this, we're not standing for this nonsense. And what they immediately did was move the company out of the US and into Switzerland. So Shapeshift is a company that really believes in the core values and core ideals of Bitcoin. And we think that's very honorable and very cool. And, and plus, by sponsoring shows like ours, they really help entertain people like you and help promote growth in the industry. So good job, Shapeshift, for doing what's right. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So one of the ways or one of the things we should talk about here, and, and we've talked about this in, in the Lightning Network context as well. So in Night, Lightning Network, there's this concept of... Um, I don't remember what their name is, but basically you have these like hubs that connect different people, right? Because if it's between me and you, then we, we can set this up and it's pretty simple. But of course, you don't want to have to set up these connections between every single party that's doing business because that's going to be even less efficient than Bitcoin today. But you want to set up a few and then somehow you can like hop like between different sort of routes so you can have a, 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 each person can have a bunch of connections and if everyone has a bunch of connections, you can sort of route through everyone and yeah. pay between each other. So how does that work? And, and uh, you call it payment service provider. What do those uh, entities look like and what is their function? So uh, the idea of payment service providers actually comes from uh, internet service providers because well, uh, if I if I want to contact Google, for example, I'm not drawing a new cable from my PC to Google every time I want to 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 do a transfer. Uh, but I, I am connecting to my ISP, and my ISP will forward the payment on my behalf. Right? Um, if we were to draw a cable uh, every time we want to do, uh, we want to do a connection, we would actually pretty soon deplete the copper resources we have in the world and and we would make use of this shared medium which is well copper um, in the bitcoin case we have we also have a shared medium it's called the blockchain its size is limited we cannot do too much uh, too much about it so we try to keep as much as possible uh, in a local fashion we don't 
we don't com we don't just shout out into the world, hey, I'd like to talk to Google, but we are actually sending our packets to our uh, local ISP, which will then forward them. Um, so that's the way. Uh, that's why we call them pay payment service provider. Um, and uh, yeah, that that that's the basic idea of it. Um, in the end, it turns out that. Unlike ISPs, we do not really have to trust these pay payment service providers because we, we have a, a number of options uh, which we can use to ensure that if we send them some money, they will actually forward it to, to the endpoint. Um, the most trivial one, of course, being since we now do local transactions only, we can, I mean, if, if I'm okay with losing a cent, I can just send one cent to, to the next top see if it arrives, and if it arrives, if I get an okay from, from, from the merchant I'm trying to buy my coffee to, uh, from, I can just send the next cent. Uh, a much more complex uh, construction would be the HTLC, the, or the hash, ta uh, hash time lock contracts, um, which actually allow us en uh, to, to build end-to-end -end security and uh, ensure that uh, the, one, uh, the one transfer actually ends up at the uh, uh, at the destination. So uh, let's walk through a scenario in which uh, Brian is our payment service provider. So I want to transfer you money. And and now like in my head, I'm imagining this as two cakes. There's a cake between me and Brian mm -hmm. that we can, let's say that, let's say I, I want to be very rich. So in my imaginary scenario, I want to have 100 BTC in the cake between me and Brian. And let's also make Brian very rich by having 100 BTC in the in the cake between uh, Brian and Christian. And now Meher wants to pay Christian. So how would that work? Like I want to pay you one Bitcoin and I have 100 BTC locked in a channel with Brian and Brian has 100 BTC locked in a duplex channel with, with you. So ba basically what... Uh... Well, we already have the, uh, the network set up, right? Uh, all you need to do is basically you send, send the money to Brian, and then Brian sends it to me. And then I tell you, hey, by the way, I received your money, all is good. Um, now, how we achieve that is, is a bit dependent on, on, uh, on, what we, uh, on how we want to do it. Um, there is this small incremental uh, type of, of transactions where you send a millionth of a, of a Bitcoin to Brian, Brian sends a millionth of Bitcoin to me, and then I say, hey, go ahead for the next millionth until we eventually have transferred the whole amount. And all Brian can do is basically say, yeah, sorry, I, um, uh, I, I'm not forwarding this, and he may have gained one millionth of a Bitcoin. Um, in the HTLC scenario, what we do is we basically secure the transfer uh, using a secret. So I invent a secret, uh, I transfer you a derivative of that secret from which you cannot uh, derive the secret, uh, uh, the, the, you cannot reconstruct the secret anymore, specifically it's a hash. Um, and what you then do is you tell Brian, hey, I will transfer you 100 milli Bitcoin if you can tell me the secret matching this hash. And then Brian does not know the secret to matching that hash. So he is forced in order to get his money to contact me and ask me uh, and tell me, hey, if you, if you can tell me the secret matching this, uh, this hash, I will, get you, uh, I will give you 100 milli Bitcoin. So me being the one who invented the secret can now say, okay, Here's the, uh, here's, the, uh, here's the secret, and give me my 100 milli Bitcoin, please. Now, Brian goes to you and, uh, and tells you, hey, here's the secret, please give me my 100 milli Bitcoin. And by doing that, we have completed the whole transaction. And at the same time, I have given uh, you a, a receipt that I have actually received the money, otherwise I couldn't have claimed it. So, so let's, 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 let's look at the leg between you and Brian. So in a sense, um, you are giving Brian uh, the secret and Brian is supposed to give you 100 milli Bitcoin. Yeah. But how does that work? Can't you just uh, take that 100 milli Bitcoin and not give Brian the secret? On the other side, 
can't uh, can't Brian uh, just take the secret and not give you the hundred milli Bitcoin? Uh, no, because that is part of the smart contract we have we have constructed, right? Um, in this smart contract, we uh, both parties are always assured that uh, one party misbehaving cannot work against the contract. And so the, the contract is set up in such a way that in order to claim the money, I actually have to reveal on the blockchain the secret. And that is, uh, that is being done with, uh, well, the scripting language in Bitcoin. Uh, and hence, hence, I call it uh, encoding part of the business logic in, in the Bitcoin scripting language. Um, so either you give the secret or the transaction is not valid. So how does that compare with the Lightning Network? What are the main differences here? So uh, the construction of the, HTLC ch uh, of the HTLCs is identical to Lightning, which also means that duplex micropayment channels and Lightning Network are interoperable. Um, we, can, we can imagine we can easily imagine a network which is composed of a number of lightning network uh, of lightning nodes and a number of uh, duplex micropayment payment service providers, um, because we can by uh, by having the same HTLC construction, we can ensure that independently of how the transfer is uh, is implemented, we have this backtracing phase in which a secret is sent back through the same route. To the um, to the origin of of the transfer. Okay, that that's great to hear because uh, I, I recently talked with with Touch from uh, from um, the Lightning Network who wrote the paper right and at the time when we had them on the show, uh, they weren't working on implementing it, but you know now they are, and uh, and so is Joseph, and then also at Blockstream, right? They hired uh, Rusty Russell who's also working on implementing a Lightning Network. And I think they are sort of coordinating to make sure that that's also going to be compatible. So uh, does that mean, are you also working on, on actually implementing that and actually bringing that to Bitcoin? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm currently working a bit on the preliminaries, uh, but I do plan on, on implementing the, the whole uh, network stack of, uh, of uh, the duplex micropayment channel. Um, we also had one student here at ETH uh, doing the next layer of, uh, of things, which is basically a BGP inspired routing protocol. Um, because even if we had a lightning network or, uh, or a duplex micropayment channel today, we would still need a way to somehow find a way, uh, find a route from, from the sender of a payment to the endpoint of a payment through this network of, of interconnected payment service providers or lightning hubs. So I, I, am, I am planning on implementing it. Uh, it's going a bit slow because this whole business of, uh, of pushing a BIP, which we need to, to actually secure all of this through the, the review process is uh, slow. And um, yeah, there have been a few setbacks on that side. So is that the transaction malleability fix? Yes. Uh, in order for all of this to be secure, we actually need to ensure that there is no way of disconnecting a transaction from its predecessor. Uh, with this off-blockchain uh, off uh, protocols, we build chains of, of, dependent, uh, of interdependent transactions, which are not confirmed on the blockchain. Um, and we need to ensure that if this transaction is uh, is building on this one, then we cannot change this uh, the the hash of this one. Otherwise, the reference from this transaction back to the first transaction would not be valid anymore. That's what what generally is called ma transaction malleability. Okay, and, and so all Lightning and uh, and Duplex they depend on this in the same way. Yes. So transaction malleability has, uh, uh, it, it would be really nice to, to have a fix for that also because Mt. Gox then couldn't claim anymore that it is to blame for their half a billion loss there. Well, well they can still say that was, was the cause, no? So, uh... Well, we, we have a paper actually proving that it wasn't the case. But... Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was never very plausible.
Today's magic word is duplex. D-U-P-L-E-X. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So that's great. And, and w- so let's say that fix happens with uh, transaction availability. I mean, is there a significant resistance or some people saying we don't want that? Or, or are there people who think it should be done in different ways and can't come to agreement? Or what's, what's the sort of roadblock there? So it's, it's always the devil is in the detail. It's, uh, uh, I published about, what was it? I think August, I published a, propo- a Bitcoin improvement proposal uh, for normalized transaction IDs, uh, which changed a little bit the, uh, the way the hash used to reference a transaction is computed. Um, basically, it was stripping out all the information that could have been modified on the flight without, uh, uh, without uh, invalidating the, uh, the hash, uh, the signature. Um, and initially, it was a hard fork proposal uh, that did not sit too well with a few developers. So I made it a software uh, proposal, um, which I published in September. And now, well, everybody wants their nice feature in there as well. So uh, we, I have been rewriting it a few times now. And uh, while discussing with Peter, uh, we actually came up with a much better solution. And uh, um, so Peter and Greg basically came up with a way to implement the segregated witnesses, which are implemented in in Elements Alpha, um, to to basically backport that to to Bitcoin and uh, hopefully fix malleability forever. Okay, and, and there are people can align around that idea or that that sounds plausible that that's going to happen? So I think the segregated witnesses uh, proposal is so far the, the easiest, if, even if not the, the, the easiest to, to implement. So the segregated witnesses is, of course, in production in Elements Alpha, and uh, it is a good solution for the problem at hand. Um, my proposals were a bit easier to implement. Actually, I have implemented them. And, uh, but segregated witnesses seems to be the proposal everyone uh, is rallying behind. And so I, I guess that, that has a good chance of, of being merged sometime in the future. So uh, assuming that, that transaction malleability is solved, um, could you, uh, can you go into how somebody could be- become a payment service provider and make money building a business around it? Um, so the requirement for you to become a payment service provider is uh, have some Bitcoins. Uh, because you uh, in, uh, initially when you set up these channels, you need some coins to fund the channel so that you can actually start transferring, uh, transferring Bitcoins. Um, that being said, we have not figured out how yet to do addressing in this network um, and how to assign addresses in this network, simply because for this kind of routing to be efficient, we need to have uh, uh, some sort of structure in this, in, this, uh, in this network. For example, ISPs use prefix-based routing, um, and that would be cool if we, if we could do that in PSPs as well. So the second requirement would be to actually be integrated into that network and start opening channels with other people. Now, on the earning money part, uh, you can attach fees to these transfers as well. So just as you would attach a fee to a transaction you send into the blo- uh, into the blockchain, you can attach a fee to the transfer you're doing in the uh, in the duplex micropayment channel network, and uh, every hop in the network would then draw some of uh, a, a part of that fee from uh, from your transfer until at the end the last hop eats up all the fees and what comes out at the end is is just the amount you wanted to transfer in the first place. Um, Basically, with with every hop, Mayhew gets some cake. Yes. (laughs) 
<laughs> so 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 basically like um if i become a payment service provider um what i really need is to be bitcoin rich so i need a stash of bitcoins that i can put in creating channels with a lot of different people right that's that's what i need and uh, what 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 would make a good payment service provider somebody who has a lot of channels open with a lot of different people so i mean it it is uh, important to make the entry barrier as low as possible so that's that's also why we created these uh, duplex micropayment channels in the first place if you had a hub and spoke model then you have the problem that you have to be really rich to cover all the transfers that go through you uh, in the uh, in the duplex micropayment channel network you would have a small amount, let's say one Bitcoin uh, associated with each channel. And since you can now transfer it multiple times back and forth, uh, this, uh, this Bitcoin now becomes much more, you, you get much more out of this single Bitcoin than if you could transfer it once. Um, the barrier to entry is, uh, is low in that you're not forced to have an, uh, a certain number of connections you have to open. All you need to do to get started is to open two connections and then route payments through you uh, between the two endpoints you are connecting to. And once you have more cash, you can then open new connections and position yourself better in the network so that you are more central to the network and, and somehow more payments get uh, routed through you. Okay. so. Perhaps, perhaps this is a, a, a nice opportunity to explain the difference between Lightning and, and your proposal. So um, if I understood it correctly, what, what you are saying is, um, in scenario one, let's assume like uh, Brian and Meher are both payment service providers on Lightning. And in scenario two, Brian and Meher are payment service providers on the duplex network, right? Now, in scenario one, so when, when, when both of us are payment service providers, uh, it's a scenario where uh, you need money to flow frequently from Meher to Brian and from Brian to Meher because uh, Christian might be a customer of Meher, or Sebastian might be a customer of Brian, and then sometimes Christian wants to pay Sebastian, some, sometimes Sebastian wants to pay Christian, so the payments are flowing in, in a lot of different directions. So in scenario one, lightning, um, so the difference between scenario one lightning and scenario two duplex is that in scenario one, Meher and Brian would need to create a channel, destroy it again, create a new one, destroy it again. While in duplex micropayment, Meher and Brian create a channel once and they can operate with it, uh, operate with that single channel, like route many more payments to that single channel as compared to lightning. Is that uh, the advantage of the duplex network? So I, I think the, um, so in, in both cases, in uh, the Lightning Network case and in the duplex micropayment channel case, the uh, channels have a lifetime, uh, which is limited. Um, some say that, uh, that a channel will be active for a month or for a year, but in both cases, they are not uh, endless. And they are in fact pretty similar because the, um, the, uh, the overall effect achieved by Lightning and by a duplex micropayment channel is pretty much identical. Where we differ is the construction of, uh, of, uh, of the channels. Um, and uh, if you, so I read an early version of, of the Lightning paper and it took me so a really, really long time to figure out what they are actually doing. Um, and uh, what, what we did is we basically started from the two single mi uh, simple micropayment channels, combined them into a, uh, into a two directional channel, and then figured out how to reset them. Um, we have, I think our construction is, is a bit easier to understand because it's built on well-known blocks that we basically analyze uh, individually and, and we can show that they are working. Uh, whereas Lightning is, uh, is a bit more complex in that they, all of these parts are very much dependent on each other and you cannot strip them apart and analyze them independently. 
So I, I wouldn't say that duplex micropayment channels and Lightning are completely different because they achieve the same goals with sort of the same guarantees. Uh, but the construction and the ease of implementation varies a lot. And hopefully, me being the author of duplex micropayment channels, uh, I, of course, would argue that mine is uh, easier to implement and hopefully get it correct. <laughs> okay, so, so the advantage of your approach is uh, the ease of implementation. Yes. Oh, okay. And, and so one, one final question on this topic. Um, so now we have kind of moved from, so when we move from Bitcoin, the blockchain to the Lightning Network or to the Duplex Network, we are um, moving away from something that is decentralized and censorship resistant mm -hmm. to a structure that uh, that has payment service providers, like for example, me, that can be, uh, that have to comply with government regulations, etc. Right? Now, um, now the advantage of of this kind of seems to be that because I can't steal any funds as a payment service provider uh, for the for the end customer it means that they can use any payment service provider in the world and they don't need to trust any of the payment service providers which in turn means that for the payment service providers I can go and set up in in any country which has easy rules to become a Bitcoin payment service provider set up my business there, even if the customer does not trust the country I'm operating out of, it doesn't matter because it's trustless, right? Yeah, so uh, we certainly maintain the security in the sense of the coins cannot be stolen by, a, by an intermediary. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that, uh, that these uh, intermediaries will eventually also be regulated. That being said, it's it should be really easy to set up an intermediary or well a payment service provider. Uh, there is no there is no license. All you need to do is is to insert yourself into the network, fund a few channels, and start transferring coins for uh, for other people and basically start earning. As for moving to a country where uh, where the uh, the regulation is lenient. Uh, that's not strictly necessary. I mean, you, you can operate all of this over a tour. Um, and uh, it's, it's relatively low traffic, so uh, I'm pretty sure we, we wouldn't annoy tour uh, so much that they would ban us. And, um, and by, by basically obfuscating your location, you have achieved the same goal, uh, you have achieved the same goal as moving to a country that has lenient policies. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there, there is very little trust in, in all of this and uh, you are free to choose whatever payment service provider you, you want to. Uh, we have an, ad, uh, an additional advantage. So uh, one, uh, some people have asked me whether, the, uh, whether there is a privacy concern because now all my payments go through, uh, through a payment service provider. Uh, all that payment service provider sees is what uh, is the equivalent of the information I would have published on the blockchain anyway. That and he does know which IP address I'm uh, I'm using. So what we what we do is we actually keep this information off the blockchain. And I would argue that in that sense we are even more private than we were in the, in the blockchain scenario. Right, because you make it much harder for you know the services like Chainalysis or the companies that do. Uh clustering of entities and all that with, with information uh, on the blockchain, but also network monitoring, right? Uh, yeah. And that's going to be much harder too. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so if, you, if you want to be private, just, just open, uh, open a connection to a number of uh, payment service providers and, and just randomize who you are going to send the transaction to. Or pretend to be a payment service provider yourself and you're routing payments on, on behalf of other people. So there, there, it, it becomes much easier to obfuscate what you are doing in, in the network. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a big strength. So one of the things, once when we had Mike uh, Hearn on, we talked with him about Lightning Network 2, and I think he made a really important point, or, uh, and he, he also wrote about this elsewhere, and, and that the problem starts to be that it becomes much more complicated 
from sort of a wallet perspective about how you know how do you implement that and of course you do have this this sort of thing that let's say if people you know i can't pay at a restaurant using lightning network or duplex unless you know the party receiving it has also switched to that so you, you sort of need the whole network or at least significant portions of the network you know to switch out to that to have the sort of you know the real benefit do you is this a problem that you know it's just too complex to implement for a lot of the wallets and maybe not for the big ones but we have wallets like the bitcoin android wallet or electrum where it's small projects with basically one main developer so yeah there, there is definitely added uh, added complexity to to uh, to implementing a wallet um but you can get away with implementing only part of it you don't you don't need to uh, to do all the uh, all it's not every wallet that needs to do all of the work um and where uh where it, there is this bootstrapping uh phase uh you mentioned that some people don't use uh, use this network. There's an opportunity for intermediaries to actually do this this translation. Um, so, BitPay, for example, is successful because they they allow people to accept uh, payments on a network where the uh, the receivers are not actually on the network itself, but they would like to be able to to accept these payments. Um, I, I do see the uh, difficulty in uh, with the added uh, added complexity, but I think uh, if we can make it easier for these protocols to be implemented, uh, then we we sort of reduce this uh, this downside, and that's also what what I've been aiming for is a, is a is a protocol which is easy to implement and hopefully get it right. I would not trust myself to implement Lightning correctly. So, uh, so one, one final question, uh, and this is, um, this regards to Ethereum. Can, can you implement duplex micropayment channels in Ethereum, and would that be easier? The second part of this question is, um, can Ethereum enable like the next generation of Lightning networks or duplex micropayment channels? Um, and this, I do have to be honest, I'm, I'm not an expert on Ethereum, but uh, I think we cannot take duplex micropayment channels or Lightning uh, and translate them directly to Ethereum, simply because Ethereum makes the assumption that we have this uh, global, uh, global synchronized state um, and on, which we are, on which we are operating. And the other problem is that we have uh, we have to have fungibility in what we transfer. Uh, in all of the descriptions we had before, we we silently accepted that the coins that I want to transfer to you, it it you don't care whether I send you directly my coins or whether you receive Brian's coins. So, the uh, the the fact that I can transfer one hundred milli bitcoins to Brian and he can then send you 100 milli bitcoins means that it's not the same 100 milli bitcoins that are directly going from me to you but it's different coins so we do have to we do have to keep this fungibility or exchangeability of uh, of objects we transfer um, but i do think there are venues where we can actually have uh, have sort of the same things uh, or the same setting which would allow uh, different applications to also use duplex micropayment channels. For example, one, uh, one thing would be if we have asset tracking networks um, and I have an asset which, or I have a connection of uh, an asset I want to transfer from, from me to, uh, to Brian and from Brian to, uh, to you, then uh, if, if we all have the same asset and it is fungible, then I can transfer it to you w uh, without any problem. Um, whether uh, Ethereum can enable the next generation of off blockchain uh, uh, smart contracts, pretty sure it can. I, I mean, uh, the Ethereum scripting language, which is, which is what we use to encode the business logic in all of this, um, is basically a superset of, uh, of the Bitcoin 
scripting language. So I'm also not a, an expert on this, but it, it would seem to me that probably if, if all you're talking about is, let's say, moving Ether, then you, you should probably be able to do something like Lightning Network on Ethereum, right? But then, of course, as soon as you start talking about interacting with contracts and uh, more complex things, then that probably breaks down. Yes, exactly. I, I, so, so Ether is just as fungible as Bitcoins are. Um, so I don't see any problem in, in transferring Ether. Um, you're right, I, I was talking about, about contracts directly and, and they rely on, on, on a global state being synchronized. Cool, excellent. Well, thanks so much for coming on. So we had, so we're, we're, we're basically up for time. We had another topic we wanted to talk about, which is, a, which is an interesting uh, proposal you have called a peer census. It's sort of like a, quite out there and unusual, <laughs> but very interesting. And uh, I was looking forward to talking about that, but unfortunately the duplex stuff and lightning network stuff is, is so complex that one just gets sort of <laughs> stuck there. Uh, but we'll link to the paper in our show notes. If people are interested in checking out, um, they can do so. And, um, and yeah, well, we'll see, maybe we can come back to the topic at some point. Sure. I'd love um, to. Yeah. So, uh, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, it was, uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for having me. That is it from our side. And now, as, as we mentioned, like links to Christian's website, uh, and his papers will all be in the show notes and, um, and, you know, we put out episodes of this every Monday, so you can subscribe to it on iTunes. You can get it on Android or your favorite podcast app. And of course, you can also watch the videos on youtube.com slash episode of Bitcoin. And, uh, if you're a loyal listener, you know what's coming now is that we have been doing this t-shirt uh, bribery contest, which basically means if you leave us a review, let us know, then we will send you a t-shirt. So if you do so, please send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com. Now, one brief heads up here is that we're sort of out of most t-shirts, so we'll have to get them produced and it will take a little bit longer. But, uh, but yeah, that's it. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.